Thank you, Marisa. Take your Bibles and open it back up to Matthew, to the Gospel of Matthew, and we're starting a new chapter this morning, and it's a pivotal chapter. It's another hinge chapter. We saw uh, uh, in Matthew chapter 13, that was another hinge chapter where things are changing in the life and ministry of Jesus, and he provides new teaching about the present form of the kingdom of God in this age on account of Israel's rejection of him until he comes back again and establishes his messianic kingdom. The kingdom of God will manifest itself in a form that had not been revealed before in Old Testament scripture. And Matthew chapter 16 is another hinged chapter because we're in the midst of the intensification of the opposition, uh, uh, the opposition of the Jewish leadership to Jesus, but we also find in this chapter the need to have a true, a clear and true vision of Christ. That is a true and clear uh, understanding of who Christ is and what He demands of His disciples. It is a chapter where, for the very first time, the mention of the church appears as Jesus uh, declares that he will build his church. And of course, it is the chapter of the great confession of Peter upon which um, the church will be built. And and of course, Jesus letting now the disciples know and towards the end of the chapter that he will, uh, he must, not just say he will, but he must, go to Jerusalem to suffer and to die, but also to rise again. So a very, very important chapter, and we're going to look at, Lord willing, at the first 12 verses of the chapter, dealing yet with the problem of unbelief, both in the life of the unbeliever and in the life of the believer. Notice what it says here in the Word of God in Matthew's narrative, beginning in Verse 1 of Matthew 16. And the Pharisees and Sadducees came up and, and testing him, asked him to show them a sign from heaven. But he answered and said to them, When it is evening, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning there will be a storm, there will be a storm today, for the sky is red and threatening. Do you know how to discern the appearance of the sky, but cannot discern the signs of the times, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and a sign will not be given it except the sign of Jonah. And he left them and went away. And the disciples came to the other side and had forgotten to take bread. And Jesus said to them, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they began to discuss among themselves, saying, It is because we took no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, said, You men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Do you not yet understand or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up? Or the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up? How is it that you do not understand that I did not speak to you concerning bread? But beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. Then they understood that that he did not say to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. All scripture evidence have shown that the natural man, that is the, the person who's not been born again, who's not been regenerate, converted by the grace of God is enslaved to self, sin, and Satan. All of his or her faculties are affected by their sin nature so that there is no such thing as a neutral mind, especially concerning the revelation of God in the person and work of Jesus Christ. There is already a a moral, spiritual bent against God and against his revelation, whether it be the revelation that's been inscripturated 
uh, as scripture or the revelation of God in the person of work of Jesus Christ. And when the perniciousness of pride entered man's heart there back in the, in the Garden of Eden, the first great monster sin to stagger in this world as, a, as, as the very result of that pride, as the, the very progeny of that pride or branch of that pride is this, uh, was the sin of unbelief manifesting itself in Adam's unwillingness to take God absolutely and implicitly and seriously at his word. That the day you shall eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. But also to enjoy what God would provide for him as his creator and to be content as his creature because the Lord said you could eat of any tree in the garden. You are free to enjoy all these things except for one thing. So pride in that form of discontentment with his creaturehood and in the form of unbelief is the parent sin. And, and unbelief continues to be the father and the progenitor of other sins just as faith is the prime virtue as, and humility and contentment. It is a, then a, a root virtue for other virtues and graces of the Christian life. So we see then that, th that in the life of the unregenerate, unbelief shows itself in the rejection of, and rebel, of rejection of God and the rebellion against him and against his provision of grace, a rejection of his gospel. In the life of the regenerate person, there is still the complication of indwelling sin. I think each of you who's been regenerate still testifies to that because you still testify about the struggles you still have in your life. The struggles with still sinful weakness and tendencies to do your own thing or to be centered on yourself. You're no longer a slave to sin, self, or Satan as a regenerate person, but you still experience the hangover of sin, of self-centeredness, and the weaknesses of unbelief. That is, as we find it here in, in chapter 16, what, what Jesus tells the disciples once again, you men of little faith. So you struggle with still the weaknesses of littleness of faith and that littleness of faith <clears throat> still negatively affects your view and our and my view of Christ see there are we may not be dominated and governed by unbelief like the unregenerate person but we still have patches right we still have areas of unbelief or we have a hard time trusting the Lord and that's where that unbelief affects our view of Christ or you could say that it, 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 you could say that, it, that it, it clouds our judgment, our discernment and of course our memory of who Christ really is. And so in this passage we see the awful grip of unbelief upon both the unregenerate and the regenerate human heart. It has a particular blinding effect upon each respective heart. And so it is vitally important for, for us to have a clear vision of Jesus if we're, to, if we're to be saved from the penalty of our sins. That's the need of the unregenerate person. But unbelief also affects the regenerate heart and it muddies or fogs up our vision, our understanding of who Christ is. It affects our memory of who Christ is and what he has done in our lives. 
And so unbelief blinds the mind to have that clear and adequate vision of the identity of Jesus. We saw in chapter 15, verses 21 through 28, how an ordinary non-Jewish woman who would not be expected to understand who Jesus truly is, let alone believe in him, showed great belief, showed great faith in him because her humble faith enabled her to see clearly that Jesus is King and Lord and he is merciful. And so it is incumbent upon us to understand who Jesus Christ is. We know that in verse in verse 13, Jesus will ask the disciples, how or what do the people think of him? Who do the people say the Son of Man is? You could say that perhaps that is uh, the, the, the most important, most impactful question. That perhaps it is. Is you need to know who Jesus Christ is to be able to know who God is. And to be able to be saved from his condemnation. And to be at peace with him. To have the hope of eternal life. The hope of heaven and to possess eternal life. So this is a passage all that pivots around the identity of who Christ is. So in the verse 12 verses here. We must then understand the blinding effects of unbelief. And we see clearly, I hope we can see clearly, by our faith in God's word, two blinding effects on unbelief, of unbelief. How unbelief does not enable the unsaved to see Jesus for who he is at all and makes the saved person forgetful of who Jesus is, even for a moment. Remember what we saw even in Isaiah chapter 53, how the nation of Israel in the future, when they, when they will be saved, will lament back, will lament as they reflect back how their ancestors, when they had Jesus in front of them, when they had the Messiah, the servant of the Lord in front of them, how they did not report, uh, believe in his report. Uh, they did not accept it and receive his report and they did not believe in him despite of the revelation of the arm of the Lord, the power of God in his life. So we see here the impact of unbelief or little faith in, is what we see uh, on the unsaved, the impact of unbelief in the, in the life of the unsaved and, the, and then the blinding effect or the blinding impact of unbelief in the life of the saved. The first blinding effect, we see it in the first four verses, which is the blindness of unbelief and unbelievers is deceitful. It's deceitful or self-deceived. Remember what Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 9 says, that the heart of man is what? Utterly deceitful and desperately sick. Why? Because of being characterized and enslaved by sin. And so we see here beginning here in the very first verse how the unsaved in the representation of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the, the, the religious leaders of Judaism come up to Jesus and the Pharisees and the Sadducees come up and testing him, asked him to show them a sign from heaven. Now, my, keep in mind that these Jewish leaders are co-belligerents. They're not true allies. They're not really friends. You may say, well, they're, 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 they're Jewish brethren. Well, yes, I mean, certainly they're uh, they are citizens of the same nation. Uh, they are of the same ethnicity, culture. Uh, yes, they represent the same, the, the same general religion of Judaism, of 
of that time, but they are really are uh, two different sides of the aisle, of the religious aisle of Judaism. And so they weren't truly allies. They're actually co-belligerents. In other words, they're coming together, not as friends or allies, but still coming together for a common purpose and to, and to deal with a common opposition, a common enemy. See, they, they themselves were two opposing sides because they, dis, they disagreed on the validity of the oral law. The Pharisees thought that the law could be taught orally. And much of it they, they elaborated and even distorted and added to the written law of God. The Pharisees were much more uh, focused on the letter of the law and just what the law said in its writing and did not give much validity to the oral teaching of the law. They disagreed on predestination, on God's sovereignty and work of predestination. The Pharisees upheld that view. The Sadducees were against it. And they disagreed on the existence of the afterlife and a future resurrection. The Pharisees believed in the existence of the afterlife and future resurrection, and the Sadducees did not. So you could say that the Pharisees were the more conservative Jewish Jews, or they, they uh, in terms of conservative theologically, and the Sadducees were more liberal. But they have a common enemy, a common opposition, that is Jesus. His miracles and the definitive teaching of the law have been immensely problematic for the power and prestige of these leaders. He was threatening that power. He was threatening that prestige. In other words, he was threatening the very power structures of Judaism at that time. And that's the condition and disposition of the real world below the surface, right? I mean, look, no matter what ideology and value system, um, a moral ideology or value system that a person or a group of people have, there is a real hatred for Christ and the gospel among unbelievers because there's a refusal to renounce pride and self-will and, and to humble, rather than to humble and submit one's life to Christ alone for redemption and rule over their lives, to give him the preeminency over their lives. In the end, unbelievers will gather themselves, even if they disagreed on many things, maybe on most things, maybe on, on they're finding themselves on, on opposite sides of the religious or political or moral aisle, they will come together in their opposition of Jesus to rebel against God, to refuse the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't ever forget that. Be very careful whom you count as friends. That's not to say that you cannot have unbelieving friends. You may have even, you may live and be raised up by unbelieving relatives and they may be sweet and kind. But realize that when the time comes and the opportunity is given and God will give you opportunities more than once to share your faith with those unbelieving friends and unbelieving parents. And I hope you seek to do that, that you prayerfully seek to do that. As a faithful disciple of Christ, you will receive opposition if they don't want to believe in what you're sharing. They may even vehemently oppose you. They may even insult you. So this is what we have here. We have co-belligerence. They're coming together to oppose Jesus. This type of opposition with Jesus and the exchanges as they have will come to a head in several exchanges between Jesus and various religious and, 
and the various religious leaders, not just the Pharisees and the scribe and the Sadducees, but the scribes and the elders and the chief priests, after he enters Jerusalem, we're going to be seeing this plenty of times in the Gospel of Ma later in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 21, Matthew chapter 22, all of Matthew chapter 23. Jesus announces there in verse 21 of chapter 16 that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things and be killed by them. So you're saying, but, but they seem to be friendly. I mean, they seem to be open because they're coming to Jesus and they're saying, Lord, can you just show us a sign? Can you give us more evidence of who you are? And you think that, man, all right, here's a, here's, it seems like someone has opened. They're inquisitive or maybe they're, they're seeking. And if I, maybe I just give them another, just some more evidence, some more clear presentation of who God is and why he exists and, and how we know he exists and why you can trust in the Bible and, and that Jesus Christ is truly the only way, surely they will believe. Well, no, not really, and make sure you don't call them Shirley. No, notice that the purpose, and the translation here in the New American Center doesn't, doesn't provide it as clear here, but it, the, the purpose of why they come to ask them for a sign, notice, it is to test them. So if, we, if you can redo the translation here for a moment, at least in the New American Center, it would be, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees came up, or while they were cu coming up, they, it was to test him, or while they were coming up, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, in order to test him, asked him to show them a sign from heaven. In other words, the purpose of their asking their motive was that they wished to test Jesus. Same word that we have in the, in the, Greek, in the Greek language for temptation as well. Perazzo is the verb. So their motive is actually corrupt and it is exposed here. And Jesus exposes it. A sign from heaven would certainly be something so spectacular. And you think undeniable because it would be clear that it had come from heaven. Meaning it would have come from God himself. Like Elijah calling fire down from heaven. To show that he was the true prophet and that he served the only, the only true God. But Jesus has now fed a perhaps 10,000 people with seven loaves of bread and a few small fish. He's, he's healed people who have been demon-possessed. I mean, really, could another... And, and, it was, and, that, and that supernatural miracle that he did, the, the demonstration of that supernatural power was so clear to them that he couldn't have just faked that with smoke and mirrors. But it was so clear to them that it, that it had, that it was supernatural, but yet they said that it came from the devil instead of from God. So could another sign, this time a sign from heaven, be more convincing? Really, the more important question is, could any sign be convincing at all? And I would say, no, not at all. What is convincing is the very saving grace of God to regenerate a spiritually dead sinner. That's what's convincing, to open the eyes of someone's heart. Jesus performs signs to make it crystal clear that he is the promised Savior King. He also performs signs out of compassion for those in need. But this request for this particular kind of sign amounted to a dare. I dare you. Which is really, for the most part, what 
people do in their unbelief. They really want to defy the gospel. They want to defy the true God, the true and only Savior, the only way to God, the Lord Jesus Christ, by again, putting up the intellectual excuse that I need proof. As if other things such as the demonstration of those signs outside of the Bible itself, outside of Christ himself, has a higher authority than the Bible and Christ himself. Because it's all about, well, we need to submit, we need to submit the Bible, we need to submit the, the, the worthiness of Christ under a different standard for me to believe in. And that's preposterous. What Christ has already supernaturally shown through the performing of miracles proves that seeing is not always believing. And we see that even in Luke chapter 16 in that parable when Jesus himself said, But I say to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, that is the very word of God, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. In other words, the word of God is enough. It is sufficient. It is clear. It is self-authenticating. And what Christ's response to them is also letting them know, you know what? I'm self-authenticating. I've already proven to you who I am. So his answer really to their request has two parts. One, it was to contrast the religious leader's competence to discern the signs of the weather patterns with their incompetence to discern the sign of God's calendar. In other words, in God's calendar, here's now the fulfillment of the arrival of the Messiah as revealed in the Old Testament. And the signs already been, have been there and they already are in front of you. You can discern the weather pattern, but you can't discern this. It just goes to show you not just the, def the, the defiant nature of, of, of the blindness of unbelief, but really the self-deception. To think that, you know what, I'm, I can stump you, Jesus. You know, if you can't prove it to me, if you can't prove it, then they must not be true. You must not be true. If you can't prove to me the trustworthiness of the Bible, then it must not be true. Or the existence of God and, that, and of his salvation only through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you can't prove it to me, then it must be true. Then what you're saying to me is foolish, right? Isn't that what, what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22? That for those who are perishing, the cross is foolishness. The Jews seek what? Signs. They seek proof. The Greeks, well, they're seeking some other form of wisdom. But that's the self-deception of unbelief. To think that someone is higher and wiser than the very revelation of God. The second part gets to the root of their question there in verse 4. An evil and adulterous generation does what? Seeks after a sign. I mean, Jesus responds to them in the same way that he's already responded to them before. They are guilty for not discerning that Jesus' miracles demonstrate that he is the Messiah in fulfillment of Scripture. They're guilty. It's culpable. It's not an intellectual problem. It is a spiritual and moral problem of rebellion manifested in their un by their unbelief, which blinds them. In a form of self-deceit. And so they seek for another sign. Be why? Because they, of the nature of their own heart. Of their total depravity. They're evil. And un they're an evil and unfaithful people towards God. 
It craves for a sign because it is looking for excuses to not believe. So Jesus' answer repeats the same answer he gave earlier, the sign of Jonah. It's rising from the dead, it, it, uh, as he was in the belly of the great fish for three days, so will Jesus be in the ground for three days, right? It's, it's, the, it's the sign of the resurrection. That's the ultimate sign from heaven that he will give to that generation. Because that will be the sign that, that really is the sign of all signs that he is truly the Lord. He's the Lord over, the li over life and over death. But this generation asks for a sign as a pretext in order to reject Jesus and his message. So I ask you, are you someone that keeps asking God to prove himself as a pretext before taking that step, step of faith? Well, I'm not sure. Lord, maybe if you can answer this prayer one more time. Lord, can you do something else? Then I will believe. You know what Jesus does with that? <laughs> Don't take Jesus for granted. Because look what he did here. He left them and went away. Don't take Jesus for granted. As the word of God tells us in Isaiah 55, seek God while he may be found. And if you do and you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. And if you do receive Christ, he will no wise reject you. There's no need here as Jesus, by his own actions, answered and then left, that there's no need to continue to accommodate their defiance. The blindness of unbelief uses evidence as a pretext to reject Christ and the gospel. So in the final analysis, the, 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 the essence of the awful grip of unbelief upon the unregenerate human heart is this. The rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ as the, as the only mediator between God and man who alone has the power to restore man to the fellowship which once existed between man and his creator. Jesus himself told these religious leaders and unbelievers, these unbelievers in John chapter 9, when they asked, we are not blind too, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see, your sin remains. In other words, you're still blinded spiritually. The second effect of the blindness of sin that we see here is upon believers, and it is the effect of forgetfulness. Forgetfulness. Notice what verse 5 now, they, the disciples now travel and, uh, with Jesus, and they find themselves now after this, situ after this interaction and they came to the other side and had forgotten to take bread. And Jesus said to them, watch out and beware the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And they began to discuss among themselves, saying, it is because we took no bread. So Jesus uses the forgetfulness of the disciples to warn them about the teaching of the religious leaders. He now speaks of their error with the, and with the metaphor of the leaven as, as a way of saying their teaching spoils things. And makes it unclean or contaminated. Watch out. But notice that the disciples are really more preoccupied with food. This is not one of the better moments for the disciples. But it lets, and it lets us know, I'll say this, that passages like this I'm thankful for because it does let us know that even as believers we still struggle. We still struggle with belief. We still struggle with trust. But we can't be content in that struggle. Jesus will rebuke us like he rebukes this, the, uh, uh, his disciples here. And we need to be rebuked. We need to continue to grow stronger in our faith. 
There have been ample teaching and demonstrations on the necessity of God's provision. But we see here that the, that the symptom of their littleness of faith is what is a memory lapse. Notice in verse 80 he says, but Jesus, aware of this, meaning that they're preoccupied just with the physical bread, you men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves that you have no bread? Do you not yet understand or, or remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you took up or the seven loaves of the 4,000 and how many large baskets you took up? See, the blindness of faith is amazingly gripping even in the heart of the believer and it proves the power of indwelling sin in the, in the believer, particularly when in moments, in certain moments, we, what, we show little faith in the Lord. And we let, and, and we yield ourselves to our own fear of man, to our own anxieties of the situation as if, as if people and situations are bigger than God. Or because we're more preoccupied with material things and, and rather than spiritual and eternal realities, we're not giving ourselves the opportunity to grow in faith. We, we just keep ourselves stuck. So then when a real difficult situation comes, all of a sudden it's like, you know, you waver in belief or you show no belief. Because you haven't been cultivating trust Little trust negatively affects the believer's judgment of a spiritual situation. Jesus is talking about a spiritual situation and they're talking about food. How spiritually myopic. They, decide, they thought that Jesus has a problem with their lack of literal food. That's not what he's dealing with. He's dealing with spiritual realities here. And so their, their littleness of faith blinds them to the wonderful realities of the character and power of God. Have you forgotten who I am and what I've shown to you right before your eyes? In fact, you've been, you were also my assistants in this miracle because you started out with a few pieces of fish and, and just several loaves and you fed thousands miraculously. Have you forgotten who I am? It renders them blind to the dangers of false teaching by the Pharisees and Sadducees because that's exactly what he's dealing with here. And it manifests itself with a greater preoccupation with temporal matters, literal food, rather than with a more serious conflict that was happening between Jesus and the leaders. They should have been seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness first. On account of this, just like the disciples, we retreat to anxiety and worry. We forget and we are forgetful. Why do you think that the Bible is so repetitive when you read it through from Genesis to Revelation? Because of the weakness of, our, of forgetfulness. True forgetfulness. Not because of, of a physical malady or disease. It's a spiritual kind of forgetfulness that is insidious in our hearts. This is how we know where our true level of faith is, how often we are preoccupied with temporal matters or with spiritual matters, cultivating faith rather than cultivating faith and how easily we forget and worry over physical, temporal matters. Thankfully, the disciples were able to grasp it. We see it there in verse 12. Jesus' concern which is with false, with the false teaching of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Oh, the Lord is such a patient sculptor and builder of our faith. Huh? It's not about literal food; it's about spiritual food. Watch out for the, 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 for the Pharisees and the Sadducees and their teaching, because they spoil the food, spiritual food, with their hypocrisy, self righteousness, and ultimately their opposition. So we must care to perceive and to be more preoccupied with the eternal realities of life than with the temporal. And recall how Christ has been with us in every step and has demonstrated the power to care for us. Let us not be forgetful hearers of God's word, nor regard even the discipline 
of the Lord. But let us remember all of who Christ truly is. And remember how blinding unbelief is in our hearts. Amen. Let's stand. Let's close our time this morning. Since it's already 1020, I'm just going to go ahead and close us with a word of scripture here. With a doxology from Hebrews chapter 13. And remember after we, we finish here, please remember to, to continue the fellowship at the, at the courtyard to let the church that comes after uh, begin their preparations for their service. But if you are still looking at Jesus saying, Jesus prove myself, then you're in a bad place. You're, le you're letting unbelief deceive you, deceive yourself. You must come to Christ. There's no way that you could ever know God unless you put all your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as believers, we have the continual calling and necessity to walk by faith and not by sight. Amen. Now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working on us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. And the people of God said, Amen. Go in peace.